Hey everyone, it's Charlie Morgan here and welcome to a video where I'm gonna basically explain how I went from zero to $10,000 a month at the age of 19, just after dropping out of university. I do not have a 997 course to sell you. I don't drive a Lamborghini and I do not have a webinar to send you to. All I want to do here is motivate you. I wanna give you a warning as I go through this story, I do get quite emotional halfway through. So please try and reserve any judgment on that. But what I'm gonna do is basically explain in pictures my entire story of going from zero to 10 grand a month, exactly what my day looked like and my routine, what sort of outreach methods I used, and I'm hoping that it inspires you. So I'm gonna cut the clip in now, let's go. So before I tell you this story, I think it's helpful that I have some level of evidence that you can trust me that I know what I'm talking about. This is my Stripe for my company, my coaching business. As you can see, this is a real Stripe account. I can hover over it. There's no dodgy source code going on here. We're doing around 200,000 to 300,000 pounds a month right now. 50 grand a week, right? We do, last today we made about 9,000. Yesterday we made 10,000. Just wanted to sort of show you this because a lot of people seem to say like that they can help you and then you find out how much money they're truly making and it's quite embarrassing. So this is a genuine Stripe thing, right? Just wanted to show you. But what I'm gonna do is walk you through my life in pictures because this is one of the most heavily requested videos that I get from people like, how did you go from like, because a lot of people, they don't really resonate with the whole like 10 grand to 100 to 300 grand a month. Most people want to know how I went from nothing to 10, right? And that's a transformation that 80% of my audience are interested in. So I'm going to explain over a series of pictures here, sort of how I did it and each stage of the process that I went through. Um, and I'm hoping that it resonates with you. I'm hoping it motivates you. And I'm really hoping that it helps you because, you know, I was able to do it. Now, we'll start from the top here. Um, well, from, we'll go from the bottom, actually, because this is what I was able to sort of achieve um, as a result of this. And then we'll go back through the steps. So this is me um, probably about four years ago, I think. This was just, this was obviously way before COVID, but this is when I was just traveling, mostly with my sister. And I had that sort of laptop lifestyle. Um, you can sort of see me here. We did a lot of interrailing. We traveled a lot on, all over the shop. And you can see me here with my laptop, um, sort of working on the train in different stages. And this was just a trip around Europe. I've been elsewhere in the world, but you know, this was the, the best trip we had. This is Nice. This is me being the strongest man on earth. Me and Pisa. This is me doing a pretty nasty whip, even if I do say so myself, in Greece. This is me practicing the fine art of balance in Lake Garda in Italy. Um, this is me also in Italy, pretending to fall off of a um, bridge in Verona, I think. This is me in, in Austria, climbing a mountain. But basically, like I was able to have this like lifestyle that I had dreamed of for years. From like the age of like 14, 15, all I wanted to do was travel the world and take my laptop with me. And this is truly accomplishable and it's achievable. And I, by the way, I'm not trying to sell you a 997 course, some bullshit like that. It's not the purpose of this video. So let's go from the top because what I can tell you is all of this was quite fun, right? Being able to live like this, and I stopped living like this after a while because I got quite bored of it. I just wanted to build a company, which is what I'm doing now. But I had to get out of my system, right? Being able to live like this is a very strong form of pleasure, right? In order to accomplish the pleasure, you have to go through the pain. And I, I mean pain, and I'm gonna tell you what I had to go through to make this happen. And I'm hoping it aligns your expectations. So I want you to know that if you want to build a vehicle, a company is a vehicle for a lifestyle like this, it is not easy. It takes work. It will take years of suffering and pain before you actually are in a position to do something like this, all right? So let me explain what I did. And I wanna be honest and set your expectations honestly because a lot of people are gonna tell you that SMMA or starting a business is this easy breeze, you know, you, where you get a media buyer and then you send 50 emails and then you're a millionaire. It's not like that. It takes years of hard work and dedication and consistent action on a very boring task in order to accomplish it. So let's begin from the top, right? So this is me in all of my <laughs> indefinite glory, which doesn't seem to exist. I look like I've got um, some sort of complex going on here. Um, but this is me at university, right? So this long story short, I basically went to university in the southwest of England, um, to a certain city. And during my time here, I was studying business. Actually, no, it was an entrepreneurship fast track course. And I thought it was what I needed to be successful. Um, this is me, this is the only picture I can find because iCloud, they fucked me over, unfortunately. But this is a picture of me doing a presentation for a project on um, LinkedIn marketing and why LinkedIn marketing was the best thing. So at this point in my life, I was basically clueless. I don't recognize this this child. This kid here, I have no, I wouldn't, I'd wouldn't. i go as far as to say that there's not a single synapse in this kid's brain that fires the same way that mine does now. I have, this is how you really want to start seeing yourself as like, who you are at the moment should be or will be completely unrecognizable to who you become in five to six years, right? But this is what I was dealing with. I was very shy, very insecure, very anxious. I didn't really, I had some friends, but I was quite introverted. And like, 
The only thing that I really knew how to do was sell. Um, but that was, even then I wasn't very good at it at all. So this was actually the first ad I ever ran. So I wanted to start with the very first client I ever signed. So when I was at university, I would basically do my degree. I was at university for about six to eight months. Um, and then I dropped out. I, the, the reason I dropped out is because I was talking to my tutor, a guy called Raphael. And basically I said to him, when do we learn to sell? Because I was reading Alan Sugar's autobiography at the time. Um, what you see is what you get. That's what he's called it. And I asked in, in the biography, autobiography, it said, you know, you have to learn how to sell if you want to be in business. So I went to my tutor and said, when do we learn in this course how to sell? He said, oh, well, we don't really teach sales. And I was like, why? And he couldn't really give me an answer. So I dropped out the next day. That was my entire rationale for dropping out was the fact that we weren't going to learn sales. I was like, if someone who's a billionaire is telling me I need to learn sales and someone who's making 25 grand a year, 30 grand a year working for the university is telling me I don't need sales, who am I more likely to listen to? So I dropped out just on that alone. So before I dropped out, I did have some level of success. So I actually started doing a social media sort of marketing thing. I had no niche, I had no service, I had nothing. It was just me and just whatever the hell I could get my hands on. So the first business I actually got um, was a double glazing company in Cornwall. Um, they paid me 80 pounds a month. And at the time that was like, I was just, I couldn't believe my luck, right? So I ended up running ads for, ads for them to, to help them um, get clients for, for replacements of broken or misted windows. And this was the first ad I ever ran for on Facebook and I thought it was amazing. I even used the send message call to action for my fucking sins, my poor client. Um, but I picked up some other clients. So at this point I was making like a couple of hundred pounds a month. Like what I would do in, in the city is like, I sort of obviously go to university in the, in the term. So I went started in September and I didn't drop out until like I think April later on that year. So for that whole winter, every day, when I wasn't at uni, I would get up and I would go door to door to businesses. So I would go down to, um, there was a harbour, because it was in the southwest, it's on the coast. And I would go down and I would go into different shops and different restaurants and different places, to like car mechanics, everywhere I could find. I didn't have a car, so I had to walk. And I would, in the rain, in, in the cold, I would just go and knock on businesses' door and say, hey, do you need any help with social media marketing? Is there anything I can do to help you get more customers? And like, they were like, well, what do you charge and what services do you offer? I said, honestly, like, I don't, I'm starting out, I'm, I'm at university, I just wanna get some experience in business and I'd love to help you. And like, from that, I landed like a couple of clients as well. I landed like this, I had to walk. I remember I set a meeting with a um, like really small startup e-com brand in the city and it was like a 45 minute walk from where my accommodation was and I had to um, walk all the way there and it was chucking it down with rain and I made it there and I, I signed them up and they paid me like 40 pounds a month or something but I was so over the moon with that like I'd like walk back and think yes this is my money so anyway this is where I started it took me you know six months to realize that university was a bad idea I'm telling you now, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to run your own business, university is a complete waste of time. University shackles you to a debt that through its nature is impossible to repay unless you give it 30 or 40 years. When you go into the university, you go into debt and that means the government quite literally fucking own you. Because if you don't pay that rent or that debt, then you're going to get in trouble. And I also learned this the hard way because I have got like six months of student loans um, against me, although I have paid, I paid them off ages ago. But as soon as you, the more money you make, the more they actually charge you on the actual interest of the loan or whatever it's called. So anyway, long story short, don't go to university if you want to be an entrepreneur. I made the mistake. You can learn from it. You might have to make it yourself. But I had some fun. I did some partying and stuff, but I did look like this. So you can imagine that I didn't have that much fun. Right. So let's move on. So enter the world of pain. Once I dropped out of university, I went through a very strong period of anxiety and fear and burnout because like at university I'd been reading I tried to read like three business books every week I was running this little marketing agency and prospecting whenever I could I also had a degree to uphold and manage and I tried to have some sort of social life and like on top of that like I would go to the library with a bag of books and like on the weekends I'll just sit there and read for like 10 hours a day if I could and it, it wasn't very healthy it really burned me out and um it wasn't too good but when I dropped out I started an apprenticeship um, this is me here. Um, this was my desk in my apprenticeship. It was a um, apprenticeship for a marketing agency because that's what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted a marketing agency. So I started a cold calling job, a sales job for a marketing agency. Um, and this is the desk that I sat at and basically cold called. I, I'd used this headset and I think I left that banana there for like three months, which was probably not very hygienic. But yeah, this is like, this was my desk. And, and this was actually a, um, a screensaver. This is called 1520 Gilcrest Drive. And what I did is I hated the job. <laughs> it was fucking horrible. Like I had to sit there and, you know, make 200, 300 cold calls a day, um, basically all day, every day. And there were days where like I would, I would, I would drive to this office and like I would contemplate like 
having a minor car crash so I didn't have to go in and make the cold war. That's how much this sucked. But I stuck at it and I, I, I sort of put through it. And this, this um, screensaver is 1520 Gilcrest Drive. It is a um, house in Los Angeles. And it's, it's kind of like my dream house, or it was at the time. So every time that I got into work, I'd see this and like, you know, it would make me sort of think, yeah, there we go. I had all my cold calling scripts up here on the wall. I had some artwork from my brother, bless him. And this was where I worked. And like, you know, I, I do the sort of nine to five thing. It was 9.30 to 5.30. And um, that, was, that was that. This is also me, um, same desk in a different office because the, the business grew. So we, we sort of moved, um, which is embarrassing. And then this is me on the right here. The left here is my mentor, the guy who taught me a lot. I'm incredibly grateful for this apprenticeship. Um, it had its problems and, you know, there were some issues with it. But for the most part, it's really what turned, you know, a boy into a man, so to speak. Um, and at this point, I was only like 18 or 19 or something. So I wasn't that old. But this was really where I grew. And, you know, I'd sit down with my boss every day and I had this ability to talk to him at, at length about lots of different things about business. He's a very experienced business owner. Um, there are things that I look back on that I disagree with him on now with my premise of how I run my company. But regardless, like he was unbelievably good to me and kind and wonderful. And I'm extremely grateful for for his mentorship. It was, it was, it was just a brilliant opportunity. And, you know, I'm glad I did it. And the, the weird thing is, is like, he, t he would take on lots of apprentices, but I, I think in my time now, I spent 12 months there. The apprenticeship was supposed to be 18 months long, but if you got all of the coursework done in 12 months and one day, you could leave on that, you could, you could graduate at that point. I got all of my coursework done in about five months, and I'll explain why I did that in a second. But I was out of there as soon as that apprenticeship was done. And as soon as it was done, I started my agency full time. That's when I really started to take off. But that was like the first thing. Now, here's the thing, right? So. This is where this is where the core lesson comes from, right? It's, it's the amount of it's it's volume and work. So basically, this is this might sound hard to believe, but this is how I lived basically for about really a year. So this is me here, and this picture encapsulates pretty much. When I see this picture, it makes me extremely emotional. You might not tell now because I've I've spent a lot of time looking at this, but this is this is a picture that I got my dad to take of me because I knew I'd make a video like this one day. So my dad took this picture of me. Now this is a picture of me in my sister's art shed. You can see here she's got some weird PVA glue in a, in a pot. She's got a random toolbox here. Um, and like this is me in my sister's old art shed in the middle of winter with three jumpers on with my cold call script here, some AirPods and my laptop connected to um, a really slow internet connection, which was outside. And I would sit here. This was on Saturday, I think, or Sunday or Saturday. And I would sit here and I would work, you know, 12 hours on the weekend on a Saturday, Sunday, doing cold calls and making sales calls for my agency. So I decided that I was going to niche down. So I was a bit Machiavellian here because whilst I was running my apprenticeship, I was also, as often as I could, building my own company on the weekends. And another thing that encapsulates this is this picture here. So the way this would work is like on my when I was doing my apprenticeship, I would basically my apprenticeship was nine nine thirty to five thirty. So I'm gonna I'm gonna write out my entire routine that I followed to to do this right. So if I just um, do this. So basically I would get up at about 5.30 um, and at this point I would go to the gym, right? And then I'd be back at 6.30 and I'd shower, right? And I'd eat. Now, what that meant after 6.30, I'd usually leave at about 7.30, right? To get to the, to get to the office. It was about half an hour drive. Um, and I listened to Ray Strimmer, Power Glide, basically on repeat for, for 30 minutes. I don't know why I listened to that song, but I can't, I cannot listen to Ray Stremmer Paraglide anymore because I don't even know how you pronounce it. But I listen to it every day on repeat whilst I was driving to work. And it was, it kept me in a good mood whilst I was thinking of this dreadful day ahead. But now if I try and listen to it, it reminds me of <laughs> fucking pain. So anyway, so what would happen is I would get to the office at eight o'clock. Now I couldn't go into the office because the office was locked until 9.30 because the manager didn't arrive until then. So what this meant is I had a window of 1.5 hours to call, right? And so what I would do is because I was in the gym niche, most gym owners would be in their, you know, in the business, usually at around like 8, 8.30 a.m. So I would typically between 8.30 and 9.30 make anywhere between 50 to 100 dials from my car, right? And what that looked like is this, right? So what you can actually see down here, I've got it open in the bottom, so you can see Skype and email open. So I would be cold calling and cold emailing people as often as I could before work started. So what this would mean is before work, usually I'd probably make like you know 50 to 100 cold calls, probably around that. 
right? And then I'd start my, on my day at 9.30, so this would be work. And typically before lunch, I'd have to make it like 100 cold calls, 150 cold calls. And then what would happen is lunch was usually about one o'clock. And then what would happen is I drive to a very, I drive once again to a lay by like this, you know, with my car. You can see my car's all steamed up here because I've basically just been like, you know, just sitting in there like working in the freezing cold. Um, but I drive to a lay by on my lunch break. I quickly eat my lunch in like five minutes that I'd packed the night before. And I would then, um, at 1300, I would then, I would do um, agency work, right? So at this point, if I didn't have any clients, which was the case for the first, you know, three to four months of the apprenticeship, all I would do once again was repeat this. So I'd do another, you know, 50 to 100 cold calls. And like sometimes I'd only do 20 if someone answered, I had a good conversation with them. But the point here is it was volume. It was volume, 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 right? And then what would happen is I'd come back to work at 1400. Um, and my colleagues always thought I was weird because they'd always sit inside the office and all eat lunch together. And I'd always just be like, as soon as like it was one o'clock, I'd log off and then I'd, I'd get in my car and I'd just drive down to this lay-by and I remember it very specifically. It's just on the outskirts of a place called Yeovil, not the nicest town in the UK, but it was, um, I drive and I'd, I'd drive down to this lay-by and I'd park up and I'd the same spot every single day and I would sit there and I would make cold calls to gyms in the UK. And, you know, that was a, that was a time of my life that was I extremely um, horrible. I didn't enjoy it one bit. But I knew that like, it was either this for the rest of my life, this thing here for the rest of my life, or temporary pain. So I was like, do I want to sit at this desk or a desk like this and make somebody else rich and have no freedom and no control over my life for the next 40 years? Or do I want to spend a year suffering, you know, like here and here in my spare time so that I can build something that's bigger than myself so eventually I have the freedom that I want. And that was the sacrifice I had to make. So I'd come back and I would then start working again. And this was the same thing. I'd do another 100 you know, to 150 cold calls. The, the person I worked for, they said, you have to make at least 200 cold calls a day. So I just, I try and extend my energy out. And I found a lot of like hats here. Like sometimes I found that if I double dialed someone, it would count as two dial. So I was conserving energy at this job. <laughs> so like I was trying to look for every little hack that I could find um, in order for me to, you know, expend the least amount of energy at work. And it worked quite well. Now, what would then happen, before my day finished, it's 16.30, I had the ability to do um, on-the-job training. So if you do an apprenticeship in the UK, you have to do something called OTJ, which is on-the-job training. And what this means is like, you have an hour at the end of each day to, to, to essentially work on your coursework for your um, apprenticeship. And you know the apprenticeship was supposed to be an 18-month apprenticeship. So they've got all these modules um, and I thought to myself, right, I've got an opportunity here, an hour at the end of every day to essentially work on my business in an indirect way. I didn't have the opportunity to do that until I cleared all this coursework. So I worked my absolute tits off to basically get all of this on the job training done about five months into my apprenticeship, right? So for the first five months of my apprenticeship, the last hour of my work day consisted of me doing on the job training, which was basically just answering silly coursework questions, like writing things up and just going back and doing all this crap, basically just proving that I was being a good apprentice or whatever. Basically, you know, whatever that looks like. But what happened eventually, once I cleared all the coursework and got it approved by the by the college, by Yeovil College, the local college, what happened is I started doing courses, right? So what I would do in the in the afternoon, because I went to the college, I was like, look, I've done all this stuff. Like, and they were like, that never happens. How have you got it done so fast? And it's actually good. Like, and I was like, I just, I just got it done. So I said to them, like, can I... I still want to do the on-the-job training to feel like I'm improving. Can I start doing online courses, you know, to do with business to improve my, you know, abilities with, with the company? And they said yes. So what I then did is I basically went and I completed Sam Oven's um, Consulting Accelerator, right? Now, when I say completed, I mean, I watched this thing like a fucking demon. And I'm not even joking, for about seven months straight, an hour a day, I re-watched Sam Evans Consulting Accelerator. Um, he no longer sells this course. It's an extreme shame. It's completely changed my life. I've modeled a lot of what he teaches in Consulting Accelerator into our program, specifically the mindset stuff as well. It, it's just changed my life, right? But I spent basically an hour at the end of every day eff effectively b watching a course that was going to help me start my own business. So it, it was mindset training. It was Facebook ads training. It was sales training. It was outreach training. And Sam Evans is my hero. <laughs> I can say with with confidence that without that man, like I was no way in hell that I could have done it. So that was basically what I did. And it's a wonderful 
course it was it's completely changed my life i've also gone on to do his um high ticket course and his mastermind as well and eventually his really high ticket mastermind and all sorts of stuff going on there but you know this is what i did and then basically at 7 30 you know I, I go i drive home so this is when it got interesting so you know between this hour i basically would um i would like do this this course that makes sense and like that was cool because I couldn't do outreach because obviously I couldn't sit there and keep cold calling for my own business because I, I kept this under the hood. So my management and my boss, they didn't know that I was building my own thing because I knew that if they knew, they'd make me pick between both and the other. And at this point, I actually had met my my future business partner, Bo, who I'm in a, in a business relationship with now. We basically are in a normal relationship, but we fucking love each other. Um, and like I remember like I talked to Bo and Bo was doing really well. This is before we partnered and I started doing some sales stuff for him, but not until after the apprenticeship. That part will come in a second. So this is then what happened. So I go home. So I drive back to my parents' house in my little Corsa. That's what I drove, a lovely little um, Corsa. Fucking, fucking lads, mate. Go to McDonald's, right, eh? Right? But I get home at about 1800. And at this point, I eat. I typically eat something. Um, and then at 1830, this is where it got tough. Because I would then do more bloody cold calls. <laughs> so I would do more work. Um, and I wish I had more pictures of this. Um, I don't think I do, but... No, I'll tell you those other ones in a second. But I would do more work, basically. And, and by more work, I basically meant more outreach. So the point I had, I'm trying to make here, is like, until I had clients, I did nothing but outreach. My entire business activity was volume of outreach at every given opportunity, no matter what or how I felt. So I would work until about 20.30, until about 8 p.m. here. And between this, this time, I'd once again, I'd try and do like another 100 to 200 outreaches. And this at this point could be cold calls, it could be cold emails. I built most of my company purely from cold calls. I think my first like eight clients came from cold calls, six came from cold calls, two came from referrals. And then between 2030 and um, about 2200 here, I would basically play Call of Duty. And at the time I would play Call of Duty World War II and um, I would quick scope with the Type 38 Hydra. I was a bloody demon. But that's what I, that was my downtime. This was my sort of like holy, holy downtime. It was an hour and a half every day of doing this. Um, and I did this basically every single day for 12 months. Now this was with the exception of Sundays, right? So I want you to know here, I'm a human being and I'm not a robot. So I took Sundays off. I worked all day Saturday and I did this sort of thing all day, you know, throughout the week. But on Sundays, that was my religious downtime. If I worked Sundays, I knew that I couldn't sustain this level of like output. And after this year, I was fucked. <laughs> like, I want to sort of preface that by saying that like, this was really difficult. This was really hard and I'm, I'm really glad I did it. But I want you to know that like after this, I was like, by the time I quit the apprenticeship and then I'll, I'll explain what happened next, um, I was like completely dead. And I was off site. It was, um, it was hard, it was difficult, but I took Sundays off, right? I, I took Sundays off, I rested on Sundays um, and I didn't really have a life. I didn't do much socializing. All I would do is just sit and, sit and play Call of Duty or watch YouTube and just vegetate in front of a screen. And I knew that if I did anything that was more cognitively demanding than that, then I'd start to you know, pay the price. So that was my life. Now, what you can see here, um, I also work Saturdays, by the way. I just make cold calls. And I wasn't great at cold calling either, um, but just the sheer volume, the sheer will just brought it through. So this was the first client I ever signed. Um, I've obviously blocked out you know, the, the bank details here for obvious reasons, but this was one of the best moments of my life. This was like, this was the guy, um, his name was Ian. And um, he ran a gym up in a place called Hartlepool um, in the UK. And I remember I made a cold call to him um, when I was in my car. It was a Saturday morning. And I had a sales call with him and sort of explained what I did. And I had this sales call in this art shed here. And he didn't say yes on the call. And about two months later, he said yes. And it was one of the, it was one of the first cold calls I made. And this is what I started to learn about business and prospecting, especially cold outreach. It's like sometimes, you know, the calls you make today are the clients you sign in two to three months. And so... If I don't make a call today, it's not the fact that I'm paying the price tomorrow, it's the, fa it's the fact that I'm paying the price in the next couple of months. So that was that. Now, this is a picture of me and my sister here. And this is a um, place called Golden Cap on the southwest, uh, southwest, that sort of south coastline of the UK in Dorset. And the reason I've got this picture in here is because this is when um, I received my first ever lead for this client. So this client paid me a thousand pounds a month and it took me about you know th two, two weeks to set up his campaign. And on the day that I launched the campaign, on the morning, my sister and I, we got in the car and we drove to, um, we drove to Golden Cap. 
And it was around this point, I got some stranger to take a picture of me and my sister, but it was around this point walking up Golden Cat that I got my first ever lead through a software called Lead Owl. And that was a big moment. That was like more rewarding than actually getting paid. Because I was terrified that after being paid, like I had done, I'd done some work on service delivery. Like I'd watched this, you know, these courses on Facebook ads and stuff. I knew in theory how it works and I'd been compiling like um, winning ad sets and winning creatives and stuff from different competitors. And I, and I, but I was just terrified. I was like, shit, am I going to deliver results or not? But I did. And, you know, and then what happened is I was walking up and I got another lead and then another lead and another lead. And then by the point that this day was finished, like as I was driving home, I think I had like eight or nine leads for the client. And I called him and I was like, hey man, eight leads came through. He was like, yeah, we've already booked them in. And I was, and that's when I was like, <sighs> you know, I was like, fuck, like this is it. It's working. Like I've now got something that I can, something's got legs and all of this work has been worth it. And this happened whilst I was at my apprenticeship. So I signed my first three to four clients whilst I was still working for my apprenticeship. So the first one was Ian. And um, the second one was a guy called, um, oh, Neil but he spelled it in a strange way. It was N-E-A-L. Not that it's weird, but nil. And this was a gym in Blackpool. Um, once again, a thousand pounds a month here. And then I got a guy called Robin on board. who was an Anytime Fitness franchisee manager. And that was in NSX. SX, to know I said like that. In Essex. But he had two gyms, so I signed up two. But I didn't sign up the second one until I was in my office a few months later. And then I started to post results on Facebook and got a guy called Callum, um, who was in Linton, which is a very small um, town in the UK. But I remember every client I've ever signed in this early stage and exactly where they were from. And they trusted me and they believed in me and I made them a great offer and it worked really well. And these guys changed my life and I'm incredibly grateful. And it was, it was, this, it was, it was this day, this was when it all came together. And I was up here and you can see the smile on my face, although I do look a little bit demented. But this was when I was like, do you know what? It's working. Like I've made a thousand pounds, but I've actually delivered on my promise. I said, I said to this guy, I was going to get him like, 30, 40 leads. And I'd given him 25% of that promise in the first day, in the first like eight hours of going live. Um, and, and hand over heart, this is one of the best days of my life, um, as was this one here. But really, I realized like later on that this, everything that I've been doing was leading up to this day. Um, and there's, there's one thing signing your first client, there's another thing getting them the result you promise. It's like, and it's why I would never recommend that a new person goes into e-commerce because the e-com game is 10 times harder than the lead gen game. And um, that's that. So that was my sort of like story for getting my first few clients. Now, the next stage of this was basically um, the building of the thing, right? So this was where I was establishing a proof of concept. And when I quit my apprenticeship, I was making about 3,000 pounds a month, right? 3,000 to 4,000 pounds a month. And I had this conversation with my boss. I didn't have the heart at the time to tell him what I was doing and what my intentions were because I would then have to reveal that like I've been building this thing by myself and I was worried that that would strip me of my apprenticeship. Um, not that I really cared because I was never intending on getting a job anyway. I didn't like that safety net. But my parents wanted me to not, you know, sort of give it away. So I told my boss I was going traveling, which was a bit of a white lie because I didn't have the heart to tell him that I basically like been building my own thing. And literally on, on, the, on the 366th day of my apprenticeship, <laughs> I, I took my, my manager to one side, um, wonderful lady, and I said, look, I'm, I'm gonna have to, you know, I'm gonna have to leave. And she, was, she didn't take it too well, she wasn't very happy with it, but long story short, she was great, she was a really good manager, I learned a lot from her. Um, but that was that, that was when I, um, that was when I left, and I left basically like the same as soon as I could. And <clears throat> what then happened is I started to think, right, I need to take this seriously. So at the time, I was obviously working at my parents, do you know what? In hindsight, like I kind of wish I could go back through this again, which is a really fucking weird thing to say, but I genuinely have Stockholm syndrome. Like I fell in love with the pain of doing this, like the grind and the anxiety and the suffering. Like like now that I think about it, I actually want to go back to it. <laughs> How fucked is that? You know, it's like, what a fucking story, man. Like, you know, I built it and it, and it happened. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get emotional. I am, I'm a bit emotional, but you get the point, right? Oh, fuck, sorry, <laughs> sorry guys. I might cut, I'm not gonna cut this out, let's keep it real. Um, but this is what you can, this is what you can build, you know, this is what you can do with, with nothing but strength and will and hard work, you know, you, you can do, you can do anything. Um, you can build something, and you know, at the time I was so unbelievably, unequivocally grateful for, you know, this, this 3,000 pounds a month that was coming in and 
you know, I, <laughs> I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But you know, sometimes I, I, some, I went, I drove back to this lay by once, and um, I ended up crying. But this is this is the journey, right? This is what you can do. Um, sorry, right? Recompose. So anyway, so I, I, I got out of this um, apprenticeship phase, um, and this is like I've, I've sort of called myself. I sort of have. I've, I've, I label myself at different stages. So at this point, I was the, I was the dropout, right? This is this was my dropout stage, and this was how I identified at this point. And then at this stage is my apprenticeship stage, right? And then at this point, which I'm going to explain, this is my freelance stage, right? Now, really, I was sort of a freelancer at this point, but it's kind of besides the point. And at this point, I was actually a business owner, right? And then you know, as, as we go on, like now, I'm sort of at this point, you know, MRR. You can see down here of like 166 grand a month. Um, that's that's just in. Um, some retainers we've got, but you can sort of see, and by the way, this, is, this isn't our only payment processor, but the next stage that I'm at now is sort of like operator, if that makes sense. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of moving through the stages now as operator, and then I'll probably move, my, my identity will shift again. So what you want to try and do here is start thinking about like the big shifts that you're gonna see in your life are gonna come through a shift in identity. So it's when you go from a different stage. So I went from the stage of dropout to the stage of apprentice, to the stage of freelancer, to the stage of business owner, to the stage of promoter, you know, where I'm sort of promoting a new thing, to the stage of operator, the stage of manager, to the stage of director, to this, you know, you sort of go through these identity shifts and it's the big shifts you have are through the identity. But let's go back to this point. So what I had to do now was take myself seriously. And to do that, I got an office. So I went to a guy called, um, there's a, there a village nearby to me, um, a place called, and so I'm not gonna give the name away because it, it, it's, it's not a very big village, right? But there was a place near to me um, in Somerset, which is where I grew up. And um, I went to this guy, my dad knew a guy who knew a guy who could give me an office. And I went to speak to him, his name was Birhag, um, and he had a wonderful wife as well. And they let me rent out this office space for 383 pounds and 33 pence per month. Quite why it was such a specific price was beyond me until I later realized that when you give someone a specific price, it makes them think that you thought it out, which actually justifies the price. So I was swindled a little bit by Birhag, but he was a very intelligent businessman and you know he saw an opportunity to make some money. But So I, I rented out this office, it was 383 pounds a month. This is actually my sister, um, the day that we sort of kitted it out. You see how I've got some plants, which by the way, all did die because I didn't take care of them. Um, but this office, it wasn't, it was pretty cool. I, I got some LED lights up here. I got a leather sofa, I got a bean bag, um, and then I got this sort of corner desk from Ikea. Um, and you know, this is, this is some pictures of it. So here's the sofa. Um, I actually spent more time working on this sofa than I actually did at the desk. And I thought this was like the coolest thing as well. Hey, you can see it up here. Um, <laughs> fuck, I forgot about this. So I mapped my income. This was obviously my first month in the office. So I dropped out, um, I think of the, of the, um, of university, obviously like, you know, six or six months or so after got the apprenticeship straight after. So this was April, um, the first month, this was the April was when I was when I finished my apprenticeship. So you can see in April I made, what, what have I got written up here? 3,200 pounds. So that's for the three or four clients I had. Um, and I would log my, my revenue, my income every month up here. And it just served as like a little purpose. I like the whiteboards. Um, but this was my this was my space, um, and I worked in here like an absolute machine. Um, and this was where like it started to come together because at this point I started getting the odd referral for my work, and you know, at this point I started building out. I hired some virtual assistants to help me with cold emails. Um, I think you can also see here, if I'm not mistaken, what am I what am I working on? Not cold calls. I think I've got choir open or something. But you know, here was where I worked, um, and this was like this was a lot more relaxing than the apprenticeship stage. Um, but at this point, I also started doing high ticket closing for my current business partner, Bo. So Bo had been watching me on the come up. He, he was way more successful than me in the sort of same, same sort of stage we were at. So at this point, I'm working on my own agency. Um, and I'm also at this point producing content as well. <laughs> These videos here were videos that I made for Bo um, to help him. Um, so obviously, we, I was doing closing for him for Northflow Consulting for his agency before we transitioned to coaching. And um, I thought that for some reason it was um, etiquette to, you know, put, you know, stacks of books, which I'd read. Um, I mean, you can look at this lighting, you can sort of see how, you know, I've been making content for some time, but this was for Bo, for, for, his, um, for his social profile. And this actually helped him sign some clients. So I was just making content on like copywriting, different things that I'd learned. So that's basically what I was doing. That's the content and everything. 
Um, and at this point, like my, my job shifted away from outreach and more towards sort of managing clients. Um, this was where I had my first $10,000 month, which was probably about six months after I finished my apprenticeship um, when I went full time. And I really hit it hard, really hit it hard. And after that point, I then started to sort of figure out how to system my service delivery with a lot more effectiveness. Um, I was still doing the closing for Bo, but I sort of stopped doing that temporarily. And after that period of my life, I obviously then started doing this traveling thing, um, taking wonderful pictures like this at Lake Garda. Um, but that was, that's the story, um, you know, and, and that's really what happened. You know, that's the, the story of my first 18 months as an entrepreneur. And it was a big one. <laughs> this was extremely painful and it was extremely um, difficult to do. But in the end, I did it. And I'm glad I did because now I'm able to, you know, build companies that can make, you know, 50 grand a week, for example, you can see here. But this is still this just the beginning. I'm sure that, you know, I'll look back and, um, you know, when we do eight figures, when we're doing 50 grand a day, I'll look back and think, oh, I'll make another video on like, you know, what I did to sort of go from that point to that point. But, you know, if you're watching this video and you've watched it to the end, I commend you because most people struggle with their attention spans. But if you're watching this video and you're thinking to yourself, like, is it worth it? Can I do it? The answer is yes, because I'm telling you, mate, if this little specky weirdo up here can eventually take wonderful pictures like this with the laptop lifestyle, anyone can do anything. <laughs> and that's honestly what I believe. So all it takes is just some work. You know, all it takes is volume of outreach volume of outreach and if you're not good at sales volume of outreach will fix that problem because you'll start doing more what you can see here is in this little spreadsheet i've had to make it really small because it's got people's data on it but what you can see in this spreadsheet here is um the amount of rejection i have this was a sales tracker that i used and you can see i've got one yes this is these are sales because i got one yes out of like you know 30 or 40 calls and that was the story of my life i was bad i didn't know like in the beginning, I didn't really know how to sell. I didn't, I had no previous sales training. I didn't really know how to cold call. I just like, it was just through pure sheer will of, you know, just repeating and iterating and repeating and iterating and repeating and iterating that I pushed through. And I don't want you to think that you need it to be perfect. I didn't know how to deliver results. I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to onboard. I didn't know how to do any accounting. All I knew how to do was pick up the phone and ask people if I could work for them. Um, in exchange for the leads and appointments. And I did that, I don't know, God knows how many cold calls I made. I mean, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. I just didn't stop. I probably called every, I think I probably called every single gym in the UK and then at least half of the gyms in the US, maybe even more than that. And you know, I wasn't very good at it, <laughs> but it's possible. And I wanted to make this video because if you find yourself in, in this sort of position, at this point in your life where you're doing something that you know secretly isn't making you very happy and you know, you're sort of, you know, you're, you're working somewhere like this and you just think, fuck me, is this really what the next like 50 years are gonna look like for me? Then all you have to realize is that you're just really this sort of 12 months of this away from truly getting what you want with no excuses. Like, I don't care if you don't like cold calling. I don't care. The market doesn't care about you. The market cares about the market and you must adapt to it. So yeah, that's what I learned. And it was a dark time in my life. It was, it was not fun. People glorify starting a business. It's not glorious at all. It's horrible. And you should really think before you embark on it because it will put you through the fucking ringer. It will, you, it's like, it's like going through hell. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's in a bit, I'm exaggerating a bit there, but you know, this was not easy. This was not hiring a media buyer, sending some emails from Lemnis and then fucking off to Bali. This was like excruciating work, draining work, stressful time, anxious, an anxiety, stress, worry, concern, fear, pure agony for years, but it was worth it. And if you do it, it will be worth it as well, I promise. So if you're watching this and you're wondering if it's possible and you've got all of this doubt about it, mate, I was littered, littered with doubt for, for years. When I, in the first 12 months, first 18 months here, every day I would wake up and ask myself if I was gonna be able to make it. Every fucking hour of every day, there was a voice in the back of my mind that said, this isn't gonna work. There was a, you know, something in the back of my head that was always just saying that, like, this isn't gonna work. You're not gonna make this happen. Charlie, what are you doing? This is a waste of time. Just listen to your parents, just go back to university. You know, just carry on with the apprenticeship, just get the job. Every day I put up with that. And every day I met that thing and I said, fuck off. I will not bow down to your fucking bullshit. I will work my way through <laughs> the pain and I will make it happen. And I am so, fucking grateful 
for the past version of myself that put up with that pain. Because without that, I would not be here talking to you right now. Now, I would be here on the planet, fingers crossed, but I wouldn't be here with a YouTube channel with a wonderful audience and a thriving business that is on its trajectory to eight figures with an amazing team and over 430 agencies that I'm taking through the same transformation. So if you ever wonder why I make these YouTube videos, it's to help people like this become people like this. <laughs> Not quite literally like that, but you get the point. Keep going, it's gonna be worth it. It will be worth it, I promise you. If you're struggling and you're worrying and you've got some doubt, just keep working, man. Just keep on going on and keep on with a smile as well. This was the worst time of my life and I'm here just grinning because I knew that all I had to do was just keep going and it would work. So that's the motivational talk over. I love you. I do. If you subscribe, if, if you resonate with this, I, I, my heart goes out to you. I fucking love you. You must keep going at all costs. You must keep going because if you don't, you're going to end up with a desk like this and God forbid a banana like that and then you're going to be unhappy for the rest of your life. All right? So that's everything for me. Now, if you haven't subscribed after watching this, then you probably should. So go and do that now. You can like the video if you liked it because it will encourage YouTube's algorithm to show you other videos like this that motivate you and inspire you to become someone you want to be. And you can also comment anything you think below. I'd also like to hear you guys on your journey. So comment anything that you feel. Comment your doubts, comment your fears. Like, you know, get them out in the open. Like, talk about them. You know, if you resonate with this guy or this guy, just tell me, you know, comment below. Yeah, and that's that. If you find yourself in a position where you have got an agency or a coaching business, and you've got a client or two, but you're struggling to sort of build it and grow it, and you're in this stage, you know, or you're still in this stage, but you're just not quite sure how to get clients, you can click the first link in the description. You don't have to click it, it's just a video of me telling you how we can help you get clients, but you can check it out if you want. That's what I did. Full transparency, full honesty. I don't have a Ferrari, I don't have a Lamborghini. I own a $30 Casio watch and I live in a normal house. And I don't flex my wealth. I don't, you know, except from using it for authority purposes and videos like this to sort of prove to you that I'm not talking up my ass. I want success for you. And I really want you to be successful. And I truly mean that. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it finds you well. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.